Okay, let's get started. I'd like to welcome everyone for joining us for today's CNCF webinar, ephemeral.run, a full application environment for every PR before you merge to master. I'm Jerry Fallon and I will be moderating today's webinar. We'd like to welcome our presenters, Vishal Biani, CTO at InfraCloud, Inf Infra and Jono Spiro, Staff Software Engineer of Engineering Operations at OpenGov. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you are not able to talk as an attendee. There is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So please feel free to drop your questions in there and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. This is an official webinar of the CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that are in violation of the Code of Conduct. Please be respectful of your fellow participants and presenters. Please also note that the recording and slides will be posted later today to the CNCF webinar page at cncf.io slash webinars. And with that, I will hand it over to Vishal and Jono for today's presentation. Hey everyone. By the way, I just wanted to add a small uh, change to our tagline. It's now before you merge to main. We're no longer going with master. Cool. Uh, all right, uh, welcome everyone to the talk and demo on ephemeral.run. Uh, so quick introductions. My name is Vishal. I am CTO and founder of InfraCloud Technologies. I'm mostly interested in Kubernetes, serverless, and uh, making Kubernetes easier for developers and enterprises. And I'm Jana. I work on the engineering and operations team at OpenGov, and my focus for the last few years has been on developer experience, productivity, tooling, and automation. So let's take a look at the agenda. I'll give you a moment to review it. Uh, there will be plenty of time for questions at the end. All right, so who needs an ephemeral environment? An ephemeral environment is one which is brought up as quickly as it can be destroyed, and they're purpose-built for development and testing. They're usually miniature versions of integration or production. As a developer or quality engineer, you want to be able to spin up a whole environment on Kubernetes. Run all your tests and be sure your code is golden before you merge to the main branch or go to production, ideally at least. As the operations team, you want to be able to provide your organization with cost-effective, easy-to-manage, right-sized micro-environments. There are many use cases for ephemeral environments, including mixed local to remote development and debugging with personal environments, ideally one per branch, integration, regression, automation, and manual testing, early feedback from design and product teams, running your CI tests inside real-ish systems instead of mocks. So let's talk about the development life cycle, and then we'll go over the criteria by which we selected technology to build ephemeral environments. Developers spend most of their lives within the inner loop of development. Make a change, build, deploy, test, repeat. We want this loop to be as fast as possible, spending most of our time iterating, not waiting. Our tests should be as realistic and close to production as possible, so that after we commit, merge, and release, we don't have to come back and fix issues that were missed during development. In the inner loop, we use IDEs and text editors, debuggers, unit tests but there aren't as many solutions to testing our changes as we'd like. And every team and company has different needs. We tend to hack things together that aren't reflective of production, just enough to load localhost 8080 and get our work done. For instance, Docker Compose, make files, or complex runners in our IDEs. Our support teams of QA, product, design, and our peers excitedly, but nervously, wait for us to come up for air in the outer loop ready to test our new code, get it to production as quickly and defect-free as possible. Every defect is another iteration of the inner loop. We want to avoid these context switches as much as possible. And while bugs are inevitable, when we discover them is in our control. The worst case is for a customer to report a defect. So we want to left shift the when as much as possible. We want to fail fast and fail early. At the extreme left, developers often pair up uh, pair to catch issues as they're created. What we need are production reflective development and testing environments that are fast, easy, and useful as early as possible. 
Now that we know what we want, how do we pick a technology? Can your company afford to set up an entire cluster for each engineer? That may not be too hard if you can afford it, but it's either very hard and or you absolutely cannot afford it. So you need a simplification. Is the solution convenient? While Minikube is cheap and somewhat convenient, it has no ability to branch your infrastructure like you wish it could if it worked like Git. You can't test new Helm charts without impacting or compromising other work you're doing. You can't reset to head and start over quickly if you mess up. You can't switch branches and easily redeploy the changes. You probably don't even have a powerful enough laptop to run your cluster and your development tools at the same time, let alone a web browser. Does everyone on your team understand kubectl? Can they use minikube? Maybe your developers do, but probably not well enough to stand up everything. And in any given situ uh, solution, is your ops team matured and experienced enough to manage ephemeral or shared environments? Probably not. Is the solution reflective of production? Can you certify a release with it? What data is it seeded with? Is it repeatable? And can your team bring it up without knowing how it's built? Faking Kubernetes with pure container solutions like Docker Compose, Swarm, or Ansible, or Chef isn't really enough, and it's not real enough. And finally, can you share new features with the designer product teams or prospective customers before the code is merged and released? Most, if not all, existing solutions don't stack up well in all of the areas. That's our challenge. So what are our options? Now, since everything in Kubernetes must be nautically themed by law, production is a battle group. It's a massively, impossibly expensive fleet of services requiring full-time, highly trained operational crews. They're deployed in a protected, secret, or otherwise inconvenient VPN location. And the fleet composition and course are decided months or years ahead and cannot change easily. As the most interesting man in the world once said, I don't always test my code, but when I do, I do it in production. Let's, let's not do that anymore. Existing solutions are sailing vessels. For instance, Scaffold, Garden, Microsoft Draft. They're bespoke and don't tend to share reusable parts or designs with each other, nor your production fleet. They're difficult to build, expensive to maintain, slow to turn, and require extensive training and manual operation to be proficient at running them. I've been on many, and while they share the principles of wind, tiller, and sail, many, if not most, of the other design features are unique to each. Where we're going, we want speedboats. Speedboats are generally cheap, at least by comparison, or they're rentable by the hour, so everyone can share a small fleet or have their own. They're fast to deploy, change directions quickly, and require almost no training or skill to operate, if you've played Grand Theft Auto at least. And yet, they operate on the same principles as our battleship, fuel, engine, and propeller. So they're actually reflective of production, unlike, say, a simulation on sailing running a docker, or a book on how to sail written by Chef Ansible. And yeah, I grew up bouncing in the round, <laughs> I grew up bouncing around in the back of this one. Uh, it was loud, wet, and I cried every time, but I loved it, or so my dad tells me. Ephemeral.run is our speedboat, and Vishal will now share how we designed and built it. Cool, thank you, Jana. All right, so, as we were talking earlier, scaffolding is just one part of the puzzle. Uh, it doesn't solve the entire problem, so to speak. And we'll look at how we design and build this solution end to end. So what we do is uh, there are a few components beyond just scaffolding. Uh, and I'll explain the inner loop and the outer loop and the working of both the components. Uh, we'll talk about uh, how do we integrate external systems like uh, maybe SaaS-based logging platform or a SaaS-based IAM platform and even use services like S3 or R53 effectively. Uh, so as an inner uh, loop, what developer does is from his own machine runs a ephemeral run, 
our ephemeral dev if he wants like a real time feedback. And that creates an uh, entire namespace uh, along with his changes, along with the rest of the stable services in the real cluster. Now, once it's deployed in the cluster uh, and you get its own small namespace uh, within the cluster, you can actually integrate with things like Out53 or S3 bucket or an external logging platform or you know anything else. The tools we use primarily here, of course, are a scaffold and Helm, uh, but it gives you a, a good running environment, which is pretty close to production as it can be. Moving on to the outer loop, uh, which is what we're going to demo today and talk a little more in detail in a few slides and the demo. As soon as the developer is happy with his own changes on his local machine, uh, that person can raise a PR. And once the PR is raised uh, within that PR, either the developer or a product manager or a QA team member can actually use that PR to deploy those changes with the rest of the stable uh, you know, services. So it's like I, I change my own microservice, but I also want to use other microservices which are tagged at a specific version. Now, by doing this, again, you get a pretty realistic uh, environment where you can use and test alongside something like AWS Certificate Manager or a logging platform or an IAM platform, which may not be possible on a local machine or you'll try to mock it, but it's not still perfect. Now, to enable these things, we do a couple of things. So first thing is the cost control. So for all of the things uh, that are deployed in the ephemeral uh, run environment, uh, we use pod instances. That means uh, we're not spending a fortune on you know, provisioning the instances on demand or uh, keeping them alive you know, beyond, beyond their life cycle. The second aspect is TTL. So every environment that comes up either comes up with a default TTL policy or you as a team can override the policy and say, I need this environment for slightly longer duration. That means the environments are cleaned up as they're uh, expiring their TTL uh, policies. The last part is auto scaling. So if you don't have any cluster or any ephemeral environments running, you're not consuming any capacity. And only when you're running ephemeral environments, that's, that's when only you add uh, the actual capacity. The second aspect, uh, integrating with third party systems, for example, Sumo Logic or Okta or similar services. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, you don't want to mock these and it's not perfect to test without these as well. experience as you can in a real environment. Lastly, want to also monitor uh, your ephemeral environments which are deployed, how they are doing, are they created, deleted, and stuff like that. And we use BotCube for that. So BotCube allows you uh, for your specific teams to get notification of uh, uh, ephemeral environment created, deleted, or, or being deleted you know, before it gets deleted. Now, uh, we're going to the demo. I just want to quickly talk about so you understand uh, you know, what we are showing here. So I have a repository called Frontend, uh, Frontend for a SOC uh, shop, uh, and it has a bunch of backend services. For our demo, we won't really change the backend services. We'll only change the frontend service. As soon as I change the front service, it will kick off a, a Docker image build. And, uh, then I actually tag the for a terminal deploy. I tag the PR for ephemeral deploy that sends an event to the actual ephemeral run repository, uh, which in turn talks to the actual ephemeral run platform. Now what it does is it picks up the latest image from the front end repository and then does that with the rest of the backend services uh, to the cluster. And once the actual uh, environment is running, it gives me back the URL uh, on which I can test, I can get some more details, and then eventually uh, after the TTL, it'll delete uh, the environment. Let me now uh, go back to so these are the two repos. The front-end repo is where uh, is a front-end service, which we are gonna modify and test out today. The ephemeral run repo is the repository in which all of the platform code and the uh, scaffolding and Helm and everything you know, is housed so that it can talk to a cluster and orchestrate the end-to-end -end process. Now, before I actually go and uh, do that, uh, let me show you that right now I'm having only two nodes in my cluster. As you can see, one of them is on demand, which actually houses the platform or ephemeral uh, run platform. And the second is a spot instance uh, because I have already one environment running in my cluster. As I add a new environment, uh, you will see one more part, or one more node getting provisioned on the fly. All right, so let's go to the front end repository. Uh, oh, before I go there, let me show you a previous early uh, deployed application and how it looks like. So this is a previous change that has been deployed. It's up and running. And as a chain, what I want to do is instead of using this uh, price check uh, algorithm, uh, which is trained with you know monkeys at the at the office. I want to use a machine learning algorithm based on blockchain. Let's say the most fanciest of all technologies in the world. 
So let me go ahead and change uh, that in the uh, code and, and then we'll see how that uh, rolls out in a real environment. Yeah, it, it turned out that it was better for our fundraising to, uh, to add it. Right. We price check your socks with All right, that's all the change. And that's all we need to raise our next round of funding, I believe. So I'm gonna create a PR out of that. So I propose a change. Now, as soon as I raise a PR, uh, we will see the bill getting kicked off, uh, which will uh, create a Docker image. Now, before we actually deploy to the cluster, we will of course need the image because if the image is not ready, we can't really pull the image and deploy it to the cluster. And now, one, the one of the things, oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead, John. One of the things uh, that ephemeral.run does is, you know, you're gonna have more than one service that you're testing. It's, you're gonna have maybe dozens of services. So your PR is gonna build a subset of them, zero or more, right? It's, we have to wait for the build. Uh, it'll get pushed and it'll get tagged and pushed to our uh, registry. And then ephemeral run is going to check there to see, is there a service build for this PR for this service? If there is, it's gonna prioritize that one and that's what it, we're gonna launch with. That's how we get our changes in. If not, it's gonna use one from our uh, baseline, uh, in this case, the main branch, or it could be latest. We tend to prefer uh, tags with the name of the branch on them since they're not ambiguous. Great, so the build is finished and I want to deploy this change with the rest of the services. So what I'm going to do is I'm simply add a label for ephemeral deploy. And our ephemeral run bot should uh, respond to us in a minute or so. So what's happening right now is uh, GitHub Actions has picked up uh, our label change and it has dispatched a request to the ephemeral.run repo. You could just think of it as the main or central repo. Um, it doesn't really have any code in it. It has the configuration for all of our services. And uh, that repo is actually going to receive the request and it's going to start putting together uh, our cluster. Well, technically our namespace, the cluster is already running. Right. And as you can see, it has already responded with uh, the, the status and the link to the actual job, which does uh, the, the deployment. I also want to show you uh, while we are waiting on that, uh, we will look at the nodes and there are two nodes right now. And there are uh, these many namespaces, one of which belongs to the previous uh, environment, which is running. And we'll watch, you know, as the build kind of progresses on the GitHub Actions, we will see uh, more pods, uh, or rather, first names gets created, and then, uh, oh, right there. So we can already see that a namespace has been created, and I'm going to watch the pods in that namespace uh, and also uh, nodes at the same time. Uh, still working on that, I believe. That's interesting. You type nine and it's showing eight. Is that? Look at the error from server not found end dash eight and you're typing nine. <laughs> uh, we, can, uh, we can see this also in Slack uh, from BotCube. All oh, right. Show the new environment. Yes. There it is. Uh, I can see a new namespace has been created. It's a little concerning when the source of truth is a Slack channel and a bot and not kubectl, but you know, we'll roll with it. Yeah, so what we're doing is we're putting, we're putting everything into one namespace. This even works for teams that have their services 
across multiple namespaces as long as you don't have uh, any overlap. Um, at OpenGov, we actually have lots of different namespaces, but we had no trouble moving everybody into the same one for the purpose of these environments. Yeah, so as we can notice, uh, it first deployed the entire application along with our change front end service. And initially they went in the pending state and that probably kicked off adding a new node to the cluster. So we had 110 and 252. And then we see 130 getting added. So net we have now three nodes. Uh, the additional node is ephemeral or on the spot instance. And this should be running in probably another 20 seconds or so maximum. And so should our job kind of get finished around the same time. And just to verify the front end uh, service that we deployed is the latest one. I just want to describe and quickly check it out. All right, yeah, we can see the PR9 tagged with the image. Let me go back to the job and see how it is doing. And once the job itself is finished, uh, we should see on this PR the details of the latest environment that is ready for testing. This is actually the longest it's taken. We got unlucky and needed a new node. Cool. So one thing to note about the comment here, it looks like boilerplate, but there's actually a, a lot of useful information in it that's customized for uh, your organization. So we have uh, information about um, BotCube. We have commands uh, to work with uh, kubectl to connect to your EKS cluster in this case. And we even tell you which images we used to put together uh, your service. In this case, you can see here, OpenGov InfraCloud, that's our registry. Front end is the service, PR9 is the tag. Great, let's see, uh, do we have our latest machine learning blockchain based algorithm live? There we go. Uh, of course, this for the purpose of demo, uh, you know, this was a small change that we did. But in practice, you can imagine as a, as a developer, I want to change my services with the rest of the services with integrations and some real time systems. Everything becomes so much more smoother, uh, not just for developers, but also for quality engineers and product managers and designers potentially. Now we can update these changes very easily and relatively much more quickly. Should we add an exclamation to the end? of that sentence, yeah, it might make it more exciting. Absolutely. Any other buzzwords come to mind? All right, I'm gonna add three. Three exclamations for three dollar signs. Mm -hmm. And while it uh, builds the image, did it update? Yes, it did. So what's going to happen now is uh, we're going to build. We'll push the new tag. Uh, ephemeral run will do the exact same thing. Because we are using a scaffolded part under the hood, it's just it's going to notice, oh, there's just a small change to the environment. It'll top it up. It'll update it. It'll redeploy the service. And we'll, uh, we won't have to do anything else that we've already done. Really, most of the time waiting in this case is just waiting for GitHub Actions to bring up an environment.
Is the burden of image taking so much time? Let's see. Yesterday, it did not actually refresh on that page. Okay. It, yeah, it'll speed better. through this. I'll take yeah, a little bit of slowness. Goodness. It is working. This is a live demo, so not so bad. Cool. Right. Now, I removed my label uh, earlier so that I can again, again label it and, and deploy again. So I'm going to again attach the label. This is admittedly and a little like, bit inelegant, but uh, this is how we're using it today. Now, if you were going to launch these from your laptop, uh, you would use our command line tools to get it going. You'd be pushing the images to the registry from your laptop manually, um, and you'd be starting the environment from your laptop. So you would you would lose a little bit of uh, convenience, like BotKeep wouldn't be, actually BotKeep would still be monitoring the environment, uh, but you wouldn't have GitHub's UI or anything to work with. You would be driving it from your machine. Yeah, this one should take slightly or almost half of the time that it took last time. Now, all the environments will still be uh, adhering to your TTL. So even if you run it locally, no matter where you start one from, uh, it's when the names, it's, uh, we're tracking when the namespace is created for the TTL purposes. It is on you to destroy it if you want early, or you can just wait and it will cycle out on its own. And if we're lucky, we will actually see one of our services uh, cycle out before the end of this talk. Now, even though this is done. still taking a few minutes, if you think about it as a developer, uh, it's short enough that you may actually still remember what you were working on by the time the environment comes up. In practice, it's about, you know, it'll be like two or three minutes, which is not so bad, especially if you're used to committing code, waiting for CI to build it, deploy it to a shared environment. By that time, you've already forgotten what you were working on and your coffee break is over. All right, it looks like it has responded back to the URL. Let us see how that goes. Huh, something is broken again. Let's see. I don't know if it is the image pull policy uh, on the the specific Helm chart, uh, Jono, maybe? It doesn't pull the latest image. It always you know, uses if not present. Well, it is a live demo. Something did have to go wrong. The important part is that we did get it working the first time. Um, essentially, though, this is the update workflow. Uh, in practice, it really does uh, work. The, uh, the main reason that we're having issues here is you know, we've built a demo for you, uh, but we're actually using it for real development in another environment. And uh, that gets a lot more testing than the demo. Now, uh, we can tear this down by issuing one more command to it. Uh, we can do the ephemeral destroy label. And within about a minute, the environment will be gone. Now, in this case, it's going to dispatch uh, a destroy command to the ephemeral run uh, repo. And that is going to run a scaffold uh, destroy or delete. Uh, under the hood, it's going to uh, tear down the DNS and all of the other plumbing. And then we'll get a uh, confirmation, both in the PR and in Slackbot, that the namespace has been destroyed. One thing to note, uh, for those that are using Helm 2, 
uh, like us in this case, uh, Cube Janitor is cleaning up our uh, namespaces after the TTL expires. Um, in Helm 2, though, not all of the resources for your deployment are in your namespace. Some of them are, some of them are in the global namespace. So uh, not everything gets cleaned up. Uh, when the environment is TTL'd out and you don't destroy it intentionally, um, you have a little bit of trouble bringing it up later. In Helm 3, all the resources are in your namespace. So when it's cleaned up, your deployment is cleaned up as well. And Helm is, uh, Helm is perfectly happy. It's a limitation of Cube Janitor and of Helm 2. Almost done. Great. And the environment has been cleaned up now. And we should have like before stayed before we started the demo. Yep. And uh, the URL should no longer work either. And uh, we'll talk about um, how this all went at OpenGov. Cool. That's one of those times that a 404 or a 500 error is exactly what you're looking for. All right. So, uh, great. So in 2020, OpenGov engineers start an average of only one legacy environment per week using Chef, despite there being over 100 engineers across teams. Most changes could only be tested post-merge in our integration clusters due to the inherent complexity of our polyglot microservices architecture. They were not containerized. They're limited to only a few of OpenGov's core services, none of our new application suites. They were unreliable. They took hours to start, and they were in no way representative of production anymore now that we're on Kubernetes. At $150 per environment per day, and literally thousands of dollars in monthly fixed costs, legacy environments were extremely costly to run, both in control plane, compute, and in snapshots. As of the day we launched ephemeral.run at OpenGov, no one ever again started a legacy environment. Now, in contrast with the one environment per week per 100 person ratio before, we saw 50 ephemeral run environments started in the first month by one team alone of only a dozen people or so. Nearly 10x increase in usage overnight, more or less. In contrast with the limited legacy environments, ephemeral run starts many database types with seeded data and migrations and dozens of services comprising most of OpenGov's core platform at this point and our budgeting and planning suite. And they start in minutes, not hours. It's easy to imagine running hundreds of environments each month once our entire organization and all services are on board. In contrast with the thousands of dollars we spent before at $200 fixed control plane costs for EKS and only $15 per environment per day, billed by the minute, these are dirt cheap to run compared with the cost of people. They pay for themselves quickly. We haven't even begun to optimize our tooling, not cost nor performance. And yet our metrics are generally about 10x better out of the gate. The greatest value in these environments are that they are representative of production and they can be used for development, debugging, uh, certification, and many types of testing before hitting the merge button. Our teams started finding defects almost immediately and fixing them before they even made it to our integration environment. We're planning to expand our usage of ephemeral run for local development, remote debugging, load testing, automated verification in CI, and even testing hot fixes in an ephemeral copy of production. So to give you an idea of where we think this tool will take us, these are the most requested features that we think have the broadest appeal. 
a generic fork friendly framework gives us uh, a, a, a lightweight configuration to uh, in, instead of scaffold. Scaffold's powerful, but it's verbose and it's really easy to miswire. Not everyone needs that flexibility. We want to be able to get you started much more quickly just by simply enumerating your services and how they wire up to each other. A loving and proactive run bot. Like GitHub's Dependabot, we want you to interact with Ephemeral Run using a chat bot instead of labels. This gives a lot richer experience for the user. Suspend and resume for compute. This will help us save costs and avoid the dreaded TTL. We'd like you to be able to scale down your environment's compute indefinitely while retaining data. Dynamic TTLs on cluster resources uh, for, allow different environments to live for different lengths of time. This is especially important for global teams handling, handing the environments off to each other for testing. Local to remote telepresence connects a locally running service in an IDE to a remote cluster for debugging and development. CI integration could do many things like waiting for CI to finish building your PR and its images before starting your environment. Today, there is a race condition when the environment is starting uh, to get those services into your environment. Or it could let you launch and manage an environment from a CI pipeline like Jenkins. Smarter pod scheduling helps us run the fewest number of nodes required, scheduling with, for instance, the most requested priority, for example, or other affinity tricks. The default spread behavior of Kubernetes may keep many nodes scaled up for only one environment, increasing the cost per environment by a lot. Ideally, all environments would fit on a single node or as close to a multiple as possible with a high utilization per node. This way, when the environment is brought down, the node can be reaped. Bot cube integration and chat ops would let you interact with your environment and the control plane from team chat. A centralized control plane UI pulls together all the configuration and monitoring to make things easier for your operations team. Similarly, usage reporting and analytics help make the case for adding more nodes to the cluster as teams adopt ephemeral run. Adding nodes does cost money. We don't like spending money, uh, but we like spending money when analytics say we should. And finally, budgeting policies would help dynamically control number of simultaneously supported environments and auto scaling groups based on costs spent and costs budgeted rather than keeping those stuck and resetting them each month. There is something here for everyone. So Vishal, how do people join us? Yeah, thanks Juno. So we are on uh, GitHub, uh, opengov slash ephemeral.run. We also have a web page ephemeral.run. Uh, beyond ephemeral.run, we can also you know, interact with us at InfaCloud, Vishal Biani, OpenGo, uh, Jonas Piero, uh, Twitter handles, and also similar uh, GitHub handles as well. And we can discover more stuff of you know, what we are doing as well. Uh, and we are, we are looking for great engineers as well. All right. Uh, that, we're ready for Q&A. Okay, thank you both for a wonderful presentation. We have a few questions here and we have about 17 minutes before the end of the hour. So please everyone feel free to drop your questions into the Q&A. Um, first question here, how do you get the dependencies from one microservice to the others? Let's say resources, microservices depends on users microservice as well as external gateway microservices. If they're all declared with different Helm charts and dependencies is not declare in there? Uh, so um, if, I, if I understand correctly, um, whether you have a mono repo or multi repo, your Helm charts are stored somewhere. Um, your uh, scaffold configuration in this case, and in the future, maybe something simpler, will uh, say where these Helm charts are. Um, what our central repo does, if you're, if you're in a multi-repo setup, is it will clone all of the repos with your sources. Um, and that's where it'll get its help charts from. And it clones it in a deterministic place so that Scaffold can easily find them. Okay. 
How do you deal with DNS routing? Uh, Michelle, do you want to take that? Yeah, so uh, right now we have configured uh, ingress controller and then subdomain, uh, a subdomain created on the hosted zone. Uh, and for every environment, we create like another subdomain, so to speak, uh, that is wired up to uh, the environment creation process. And in this case, uh, we have a, we are delegating the entire demo subdomain of ephemeral.run to uh, root 53 in Amazon and updating it using their APIs. Okay. I believe this is in response to the previous question. Will this work on prem solutions such as RKE or VMware PKS? Uh, I believe uh, it will depend on like, can you really auto scale there? And it technically can work uh, irrespective of, you know, the underlying auto scaling not being there, but the benefit that you might get uh, might vary. We have not actually tested it in uh, the solutions. We have been using it uh, in EKS up until now. Okay. Um, just quick heads up and reminder to everyone to please uh, drop questions into the Q&A section um, and not into the chat. Thank you. Maybe that will ensure that your question gets read. Um, next question, how do you handle failed deployments? For example, a situation where the cluster does not have enough resources and the image can't be pulled, et cetera. Uh, luckily or unluckily enough, we didn't get to demo that today. Um, that does happen frequently. Uh, it usually happens though, because, you know, you wrote some bad code, it didn't build, it wouldn't start, health check failed. Uh, in that case, we output a different error message with a lot of uh, helpful debugging tips, things to try. Um, there are sometimes transient errors. Uh, you know, this is an automated system. It's not production. You don't have people there. So sometimes all you have to do is remove ephemeral deploy and re-add it and just let it try again. Uh, we, do leave the, we do leave the clusters up though right now uh, so that you can go into it, see which services aren't starting, probe them, figure out why. Uh, worst case, you can destroy the environment and re recreate it if, you, if it's you know, completely borked. Um, in the future, we'd like to have separate TTL policies for uh, failed environments because we really want to rest we want to restore those resources um, to the cluster as soon as possible so that other people can start environments. If you forget about your PR, the failed environment will be consuming resources for 24 hours or whatever you said. Okay, uh, this is a bit of a loaded question here. How robust and what features are available for pre-deployed dependencies? Can you run any task, i.e. DB seeds, pull NV vars, create Kafeka topics, et cetera? What tool are you using for cluster auto-scaling? Are you using AWS service operators or just Docker containers? Yeah, there's a bunch of questions. Do you want to take the first one, uh, Jono, around the seed data uh, and the yeah. like pre? So, uh, so at OpenGov, um, we provide the framework, but teams provided uh, shell scripts that we run to uh, do database seeding migrations. Um, uh, we're not actually creating Kafka topics, but that is actually one of the things that teams would like to be doing uh, during this process. So um, if you can do it in a shell script, uh, you can do it during startup. Um, yeah. Yeah, the and cluster auto -scaling. auto scaling is, yeah, cluster auto scaling is done by the open source cluster auto scaler and it works for EKS uh, with a few settings and configurations. Uh, for AWS service operators, I think we are using a mix, I believe. In some cases, we kind of uh, use Postgres instead of RDS. But for things like uh, S3 buckets or Power 53, we use the real thing and not really mock them. And additionally, we're using, um, uh, because we're using spot instances uh, and the instances themselves, the nodes themselves may go away. 
uh, we have the uh, termination manager uh, watching over everything. How do you handle multi-tenacity? Multi Are namespaces appropriately isolated from each other? It Okay. Um, we are just, uh, we are just separating on namespace. Um, nothing harder than that right now. Uh, we don't really have a use case for it. Um, you know, we, we assume that, that uh, you're, this is a development cluster. Uh, it's safe to run everything side by side. Everyone's cooperating with each other. Uh, this just hasn't come up yet, actually. Do we have any other questions at all? We have about nine minutes left. So if you have any questions, please feel free to drop them into the Q&A box. So uh, when you guys go to the repo today, you will see a, uh, an active demo. Um, it has all the code. We have Terraform uh, that we use to provision uh, the clusters. Uh, we have uh, Helm chart for our base cluster. We have the Helm charts for our services. Um, we have all the scaffold configuration files. Everything's wired up for this demo. It's not a framework today. Uh, you know, when we need to set this up for a different team, or uh, uh, we essentially, you know, we'll copy and paste the whole thing, and then we'll update the scaffold file. We'll update some of the Helm charts, things like that. So it's not yet a general purpose framework. That's why that's the number one requested uh, feature that we want to work on next. Okay. All right, so- How do you, uh, how do you yeah. handle, are you, you want to take them? Uh, how do you handle external resources, creation and deletion? I mean, we create stuff in here using Terraform and it's not part of our CI CD for the application deployment. Uh, it is in a separated CI CD thing. That's what we call it too, a CI CD thing. How to connect a custom deployment with a custom AWS resources in your own context, not how we would do it. Um, so we, uh, one of the simplifications in our environments is that we will start, um, uh, stateful, uh, uh, stateful resources in the cluster. So yes, we will start Postgres in the cluster instead of RDS. Um, there's nothing preventing you from pre-creating, uh, you know, a bunch of them and uh, wiring up each environment to one of them. Uh, but we found that there's usually an there's usually a uh, an analog for everything, even S3, you can start up an S3 service. It's stateful and when it goes away, your bucket is gone. Uh, we are using Terraform. However, we don't have Terraform uh, built into this workflow. Although I don't see any reason that we couldn't do it. What happens when spot instance goes down? Can we get a node back up without manual intervention? You wanna take that, Vishal? Uh, I don't think I have tried that, but I believe uh, Kubernetes will schedule that on some other node or a new node will be provisioned uh, on the fly. It could be a spot or if spots not available, it could probably go on demand. Uh, but I think the way we have configured it, it mostly usually goes on spot. Um, I was going to say on this. Uh, uh, one, of the, one of the things that's really challenging with Amazon is there's actually no way to test your spot instance termination. Uh, and we, we've talked to them about it. I don't know how somebody developed the spot instance termination manager, um, since you can't, you can't test Amazon ripping it away from you, but uh, we do rely that it, on it, that it works. And we rely on Kubernetes to bring up the new node and then to move the workloads over relatively quickly. Okay. Do we have anyone else who have with um, questions? We have about five minutes left. 
So please feel free to drop them in and we'll get to as many as we can. I think it's a good sign that we don't have too many questions. I, I think that we covered a lot. Did you guys ever try garden.io or some other similar tool? Michelle? Yeah, sure. Uh, I really liked garden.io when I did try. Uh, one thing I really strongly didn't like about garden.io was the, if you had like a multi-module or a multi or like mono repo project at every level of your repo, you had to create configurations. So for example, if I had like a Java multi-module Maven project, I would need to create garden configuration at every module level. That to me seems a little too intrusive, uh, at least when I tried last. And I didn't want to, you know, kind of deeply combine my source code repo with, with an external configuration language. I think we did evaluate garden tilt as well as uh, scaffold when we initially started this uh, project. Scaffold seemed, uh, like better off the other choices. Yeah, we, we looked at actually uh, quite a lot more tool, quite a lot of tools. Um, a lot of them are dead at this point. You know, they're the source code's still on GitHub, but they haven't been um, maintained in months, years at this point. Uh, that was one of our criteria. It needs to be an, well, we wanted an actively maintained project and there wasn't one. So we, we had to build one for ourselves. Uh, that's why we uh, use Scaffold that is very much actively developed. We're not, we're also not hoping to replace Scaffold. We're just hoping to provide a simpler uh, layer in front of it. Anybody have any last minute questions at all? What about telepresence? Saw it on the roadmap. Yeah, um, we very much want to get telepresence working. Uh, our developers want to be able to um, live, they want to be able to debug a running service running in their ephemeral environment. Now, there's a few different ways to do that. Uh, we haven't yet uh, gotten this to work. We haven't yet tried them. You should be able to connect a remote debugger um, from your IDE to the cluster with enough you know, port mapping, stuff like that. Uh, another way of doing it though would be you start up a, a cluster without the services that you wanna debug and you'll start them locally on your laptop and you'll connect your local laptop service to the cluster, hence telepresence, or you'll bring it to you. Um, and then you should be able to you know, step debug and uh, work with it. We haven't, uh, we haven't gotten to it yet but it's, uh, it'll be one of the next things that we work on. Anyone else? Anyone at all? So uh, we hope that you will uh, head to ephemeral.run. Uh, start the repo to let us know that you're into the project and to get updates um, <clears throat> for releases and things like that. Uh, fork it, try to make it work on your, uh, for yourself, um, open a PR or at least open an issue. Um, we wanna be devoting more resources to this. We're hoping that the community shows, if they're interested, shows their interest and you know that'll help, that'll help justify uh, spending more time on it and, uh, you know, getting the framework uh, available for everyone to use in their own projects. Excellent. Cool, well, we're at the top of the hour, bottom of the hour? Top of the hour. I should probably about. know this. Just about, yeah, well, we're wrapping up here. Um, but I wanted to thank um, our presenters today for a wonderful presentation. Thank you both so much for taking time out of your days to join us. And I also want to thank everyone for attending today's CNCF webinar. 
Um, as I said before, today's recording and slides will be available on the CNCF webinar page at cncf.io slash webinars. Thank you all for your time today. Everyone take care, stay safe, and we will see you at the next CNCF webinar. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.